All right. Okay. I'm going to teach you now how to become an expert in property values. So if you can, attend as many open for inspections as possible. So as alluded to in step number two, what you now need to do is you need to start attending the open for inspections and you need to do this for a period of 12 to 16 weeks for you now to come up to speed and get your due diligence up to speed. Now, the longer that you can do open for inspections, the better it's going to be for you. Um, these days, I don't get to the open inspections as much as what I would like to. I actually have other people out doing that on my behalf now. So if you don't want to go to the open for inspections, obviously it's good if you can, but you know that is something that you can also delegate as you start to get more busier as well. So um, you can pay somebody to do it for you to collect all the real estate agents brochures and report back to you. Um, if you're a shift worker that works every single Saturday, it's not impossible to still do renovating, so there are ways for you to do that. Okay. Um, open for inspections are absolutely fantastic for coming up to speed with your property knowledge because what they do is they actually give you a physical inspection of the property. Just, surf, just looking at a picture on the internet is not enough because the reality is, is that photos can quite often paint a property to look much better than what it really is. Um, I actually went through a property. My sister's coming from San Francisco next week. She lives there and she's relocating back to Australia and she was actually looking at some rental properties. She rang me up and said, um, want this property. Can you put an application on my behalf? And I said, look, you know, um, you really should look at the property first. And she said, I want it, I want it. So I actually took it upon myself to actually go and look at the property last week. And when I went through, I was horrified. It, they made it look so good on the internet um, as opposed to what it was like in real life. So if possible, try and get through as many properties as you can. Now, um, in this initial due diligence period, what I will require you to do is basically attend every single property that comes on the market. Now, you're either going to do apartments or you're going to do houses. If you're going to focus on apartments, there is absolutely no need for you to go through the houses okay likewise on the flip side if you're going to concentrate on houses and not even touch apartments there's no point going through the apartments so whichever housing type you're going to concentrate concentrate on going through all of those particular properties now what I need you to do is I need you to go through let's can I assume for the purpose of this workshop we're all just going to focus on houses is that okay yeah. so I don't have to keep duplicating things um, let's say you're focusing on houses, what I need you to do is when you start the due diligence process, I need you to go through the two bedroom houses, the three bedrooms, the four bedrooms, the five bedrooms. I need you to go through the waterfront mansions if your suburb has them. I need you to go through the unrenovated and I need you to go through the renovated houses. Okay, so you're going to be going through all the renovated houses that offer absolutely no potential to you as a renovator, but why do you think you need to go through them? So you can see how people are renovating in your area, what style, what styles are selling best. You also need to see what your properties need to aspire to in terms of the style, um, the standard, and you'll also get to see, more importantly, what the resale figures are in your suburb. Now, if you don't know what the resale figures are, then how on earth can you work out these calculations as to what you need to be buying and selling for? So you have to go through every single property for at least that 12 to 16 week period so you can get that knowledge. So needless to say, you're all going to be going out and and, you know, it's not uncommon that you might be going to 5, 10, 15, 20. When I first started in Balmain, I was going to approximately, I think it was about 30 or 40 open for inspections every single Saturday. So that was quite challenging in terms of getting all around to them. So I have developed a little run sheet for you. What you don't want to be doing is in the car, basically, particularly for the husbands and wives, you don't want to be in the car bumbling around with your newspaper going, oh, okay, well, that property, what property? Uh, that one was open at number, that was open from 11, 11, 15. Oh, it's 25 past 11, we won't make that. So that's what you don't want to be doing, okay? So um, because I'm super organised, what I did is I um, developed a run sheet years and years ago. So I'd get the local paper, uh, sorry, the domain, the, the big paper that comes out on a Saturday morning, early Saturday morning, and I just basically logged what properties I um, put it into Microsoft Excel and I data sorted by the open times and it gave me a run sheet of basically all the properties that I needed to get through. You can actually now on domain.com, you can actually download an open for inspection sheet which does that automatically all for you now or you can use my template in your little system there um, that basically uh, helps you do that. So what you do is you don't want to be taking the paper, you sort of taking one piece of paper that has all the properties listed in chronological time and when you do that you've got a much better chance of actually getting through all of them each day rather than only 20% of them. It's on. With um, prices that are undisclosed when they sell at auction, is there any way of finding that out? Or RP do data. Okay. But it yeah. takes approximately anywhere between six to three months to actually come up so mm. um, it, that's the only way that you can. If you have a good relationship with your agents they'll tell you. Okay. So that's why there's so many advantages to um, making them your new best friend. 
Um, they, they won't tell the average um, weekend warrior, but they will tell you as a professional investor um, if you've got good relationships with them. All right, so open for inspections, what they do is they give you a physical inspection so you can really see, because the reality is on the agent's brochures, they're not going to show any adverse effects. They photograph the best parts of the property, okay? So by you physically going through, you can see what those things are. Um, it also gives you a, a glimpse of who the actual buyers are going through the property. So you're going to be going through houses open for inspections with 10, 20 other people on a Saturday morning, and you should be keeping an eye out, looking at who are the types of people. You're going to quite often see the same buyers going through the same houses, but at least you can get to glean an understanding, hey, this is an area where there's a lot of young families, you know, two people with small children, whatever it may be, and that's going to confirm those demographics of who your likely buyer is going to be. It also gives you an opportunity to eavesdrop on conversations as well. Um, so I've done a lot of this over the years. Um, when I've out been out um, inspecting properties, you know, you've got to be careful of this because when the agents, it's a real game with the real estate agents and I guess the challenge for you is that you want to have these really good relationships but you also want to be somewhat guarded about what you tell them as well. Um, in my very early days, um, I didn't pick up that the agents were actually sort of milking my knowledge as well. So quite often I'd go through, you know, Chris, the real estate agent would see me come through and they will get to know you. Like when you start going through every single property for the first period of that 12 to 16 weeks, they're going to say, um, who are you? Like, I've been seeing you at all these houses. What are you doing? And you say, what you say to them is, look, I'm actually looking to buy a property in this area. I'm actually setting, I'm in the process of setting up a company to basically renovate for a profit, buy houses and renovate them for a profit and resell them. Um, I'm actually just in my initial three month due diligence period. So I'm trying to get through as many houses as I can to quickly build my knowledge on the property prices and what type of properties are selling here that are in demand. So if you say that to them, then they'll basically understand what you're trying to do. What's that? Can I write that down? I can. I can create a template if you want. <laughs> you want me to? Yes. All right, consider it done. Um, uh, Mary Ann, can you put that on my to do list? I might even do it tonight for you um, when I get home. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> I don't know. We'll see, okay? Um, all right, so what, in fact, I probably won't do it tonight. I will do it tomorrow night for you because I finished an hour earlier tomorrow night. Okay, so um, what happens is in my early days, um, so obviously the agents will start to know that you're looking to become a professional renovator, you're setting this up as a professional, and they'll start to actually bounce questions off you. So quite often, Chris, the agent, or Monique, whoever it would be, they'd say, they'd see me come through a property and they'd say, oh, Cherie, what would you do to this property? And silly me, you go, um, uh, I actually think I'd probably re like put a new kitchen in. I'd probably open this doorway so that um, I can, you know, create open plan living, whatever. I'd probably knock out that toilet in the back. I'd probably try and relocate it up here. Oh, good. Right, nice. Cherie would leave. Joe and Sally come through. They'd say, um, Chris, the agent would say, well, what I suggest you do, this property has a lot of potential. What I suggest you do is you basically knock out the kitchen and you relocate that bathroom to the back there and you take out that wall and do this. And then Joe and Sally suddenly become interested. So what you need to do is you need to be very careful not to disclose what information um, you will basically do to property. Don't give away your, this is now your intellectual property. Don't give it away to anybody, okay? Um, also, the agents are going to know you're going to start monitoring prices. Your speed, your not property knowledge on property value is going to come up to speed very quickly. So what they'll always say is, Cherie, what do you think this property is worth? What are you going to say? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> what are you going to say? You tell me. Do you think that's, you think that's going to be a good way to um, build a relationship with an agent? You tell me. No, what you say is, um, I don't know, Chris. I say, I haven't crunched the numbers on this yet, so I haven't worked it out. So I'm not skirting the issue. I'm not being mean in any way. I'm just saying, I don't know. I haven't crunched the numbers yet. It looks good, but I don't know. I don't know the crumb. I haven't crunched the numbers yet. So that's an excellent response to skirt around the issue. Because what you don't want to say is, Chris, I reckon this property is worth 600 grand. Because what he's going to say, Joe and Sally, who's come in and after you, the market feedback is 600 grand around the 600 grand. What that does, it actually pushes the price up with the next buy. They go, okay, the market's saying 600. We now have to pay a minimum of 600 to even have a remote chance of getting the property. So people start to bump their price. So they go, we'll go to auction. We know it's got to pay 600 at least now. Maybe we'll go up to 620, 630. That's our limit, okay? So the price, when you start disclosing pricing, even now, like now, I've got a, such a good relationship with the agents that I'll go to a property and I'll say, Chris, what do you want for this property? And you'll go, look, they want 800. Okay, you're joking. 
800 grand, you're joking, dreaming any day of the week. I'll say, probably it's not worth 800, Chris. I said, this probably is only worth 700 based on this sale there, there and there. You know, for me to, I need to be reselling this at 1.2. I've got cost of 142%. It's not going to stack up. So when you get really good relationships where the agents can trust you, then you can start disclosing your financials of what you work. And they, the reality is they will know what figures you're working on when you start to show them. So don't be afraid to show them these resale calculators and your purchase price calculators. Sheree, I was just wondering, just to clarify, is um, the term due diligence your term or is it a general term used I in wish. the industry? Uh, no, I'm not that good. Um, no, due diligence is a very generic term that's used across um, many industries, not just property, many industries, medical. Um, it just means research. Okay, thank you. I wish they'd just call it research. <laughs> It'd be easier to say. Um, but yeah, just, it's a fancy word for just research. But you need to start saying this when you go out to your agent and say, look, I've been doing my due diligence. Most people, most mum and dad weekend warriors wouldn't even use it. So even you just using that word will help you look more professional than what you really are just by using the terminology. Okay, question up the back there. Hi, Sheree. Hey. Um, I was just wondering if uh, you should go through the same properties more than once or do you only visit them once? I'm going to talk to you about that. Yeah, we're coming to that. Definitely a strategy there. So no, the answer is that you'll go through them once publicly and then uh, another time in private. So I'll talk to you about that. Thank you. Yep. Okay, um, so it gives you an opportunity to eavesdrop on what people are saying so you can scope out uh, what potential buyers are. The reality is that when I go into a property, I scan the property. So the last thing you want to be doing as renovators is going through an unrenovated property comes on the market, um, property comes on the market, you know, agent takes people going through the door. The last thing you want to be doing is walking through the property going lifting up the curtain, looking at everything. What is that saying to somebody? She's keen, all right? Your objective is to walk through your, these unrenovated properties, to walk in, basically scan the room, walk in, in, out, walk around the backyard, you know, look up the neighbours, thing, blah, 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 go in, go out, say, okay, Chris, I'll call you later, Chris. Okay, that's it. Don't sit, stand around, linger, whatever. I mean, if you want to sit and eavesdrop on conversations of other people, fantastic. Any properties that I'm particularly interested in, quite often I'll take Steve and um, basically say, you know, if I can hear people saying, because I see it all the time, I see people going, maybe we could put a second story on this house. You're out in the backyard looking back at the house saying, maybe, I've got to be careful, I know it falls off the step. Maybe I can put a second story. So I'll basically go to Steve or whoever I'm going to the property inspection with and I'll say, um, and I'll make sure they hear it, right? Um, so I'll just say, there's no way you can put a second story on this. It's way over the FSR and the DCP and the LCP, um, LEP, DCP won't allow it. And they'll just think, what the freaking hell is she talking about, right? She's talking about... And it's scared, it puts fear into buyers. So as I said, this, this, is, um, this is a game and it's who plays the game. The so what you'd want to do is if they're probably that you're really interested in, like you do want to put an element of fear in people because a lot of people just don't do their research. You know, the old contamination works a treat. Um, you know, why would you buy this psych? You know, contaminated landfill underneath. Whew, expensive. Um, and then out you go. Um, so <laughs> all sorts of things, okay? Uh, and it's fun. You can have a lot of fun with this. Um, okay. Going through Open for Inspections also, it gives you great opportunity to glean design ideas as well. So the reality is um, half of you in this room have got no design ability whatsoever. Good thing is you don't need, and I'm certainly not a great designer, but you copy other people's great designs. So going through Open for Inspections on the properties that are selling, like some properties are going to have a lot of buyers competing for the property, and you should be paying particular attention to what those properties are and what is it that's making people fall in love with those properties. Because if something is making them fall in love, then you should replicate it on your projects too in that same side because it's working there no reason why it won't work for your side as well okay also attending the open for inspections gives you a great opportunity to work, network with the real estate and so as i said earlier i'm always going in you know, strolling into the properties hey chris how are you going um you know how's the market this week um you know Good interest in this property? Any interest? What's the feedback been like? What sort of price are you expecting, Chris? So I always start back to them. Chris, what sort of price are you expecting for this property? So if you're asking me, I get it off him first. So just try and, try and um, do those sorts of things. Okay. 
Now, when you, open the, when you attend the open for inspection, never discuss the project in detail, okay? So um, don't discuss the price with the agent in front of other buyers because all those other buyers, particularly uh, the weekend warriors, they don't, they, they're looking for, to glean any information because they just have no idea. They're plucking figures out of the air half the time. So don't ever discuss the project in detail because the reality is, is that when you're hanging around discussing the project in detail, your interest will feed the interest of other people as well. So um, what you want to do is you want to come through quickly, you want to scan the property, get out, and then you might, and look, you might walk through a property where you walk through and you're so excited that the prospect that you're just walking through going, oh my goodness, this is just like the deal from heaven. I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it. But you're walking out. See you, Chris. I'll call you later. All right? You're going to pretend that you are not interested. You just cannot show any interest because, as I said, it will feed the interests of other people. So um, go out of that property, you know, give it an hour, phone Chris and say, Chris, I'm interested in this property. I want to come through and do a private inspection. So I'll talk to you about that shortly. Okay. Now, um, so there's a, a few little sheets there. Now, what you want to do is when you're going to these open for inspections, your objective is to try and collect as many agents brochures as possible. The reality is um, in all different suburbs, you'll either get things like this, you know, you've seen these magazines where they have like 10 or 20 properties in them at any one point in time. You know, McGrath, um, doesn't matter where you are and what state, um, a lot of agencies have. You've all seen these sorts of things, these property magazines. So in your target suburb, you need to start collecting at least two of these a week, and I'll tell you why. Um, so when you go collect these brochures, try and collect, and if they don't have brochures, sometimes agents, particularly in the outer suburbs, they don't have these magazines. So quite often you'll just walk to a door and... Um, I actually have. I just picked this up yesterday. Uh, five to six, oh, it's only single. I thought it was a whole block. I got excited. Um, a whole block of uh, ugly red brick units. Um, I know this street is a particularly good street, but it's only just one. That's a shame. I would have been arms going, see you later, guys. And workshop's ended. Gotta go. I say, <laughs> okay. Okay, all right. So. What you do want to do is in the outer metropolitan suburbs, you basically, um, agents will just give you just, you know, one single property at the door. So make sure you get to, so I can have two, please, okay? Um, so what you want to is you've got to go into your due diligence system, and I'll explain that in a second. All right, so get these. Now, the reason why you need this, this is, these, this, this is the cornerstone, the fundamentals that you're going to start to build your property due diligence system. The reality is, is these agents' brochures actually give you a lot of information. They give you a photographic record of the actual condition of the property, okay? They they give you quite often the floor plan, so you can see you've got all the dimensions of the property, so you can tell what the internal size of the house was. They always have the land size. Um, they always have the features, the aspects, the agents that sold it, um, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, all that sort of stuff, and how many car spaces. So they typically contain a lot of information for you to go back historically. Now the problems with you know, systems like RP Data are absolutely fantastic, but as professional renovators, you don't want to base all of your due diligence system based on RP Data. And I think many of you, uh, I will go through what I said in my introductory seminar about online systems, but you definitely want to back it up with this one. So um, now just before that, it's, it's going to be a time where you've got a wedding to go to or some social engagement, whatever, or you're working where you can't go through every single open for inspection. So if that's the case, just download it from the internet. It's better to get at least the property, even if you just download the property brochure from the internet, at least down, download it because you've got to start building your property due diligence system. I basically say to all my graduates around the country, do not buy a property until you've got at least 100 properties in your property due diligence system because your due diligence system is not going to mean anything with just two properties in it. But when you start notching up around the 100 mark, you're going to start to see patterns of what's happening in your own individual suburbs in terms of the pricing values. All right, so I'm going to show my due diligence system. Now, a lot of you have already got my due diligence system, is that right, from your little starter packs? Okay, so I'm going to just go through my due diligence system. As I said, this folder has made me a multi-millionaire, this folder alone, because I'm so good with the property pricing. I've got my finger, I've got probably much better property knowledge than the actual agents, because I'm going through every single property on the market, not just the ones that they list, okay? So it's a very powerful system, a very simple system, but this system is going to do wonders for you, even as a professional renovator. 
So basically what it is, it's just I have one suburb per, um, sorry, one folder per suburb, okay? And what I do is I break it down. So I break it down, I, I concentrate on houses. So in my early days, when I first started in Balmain, I was looking at terraces, I was looking at semis, I was looking at freestanding houses. And so what I did is I actually broke this due diligence down into the type of housing types. So the problem is, is if you cross collateralize your, your housing styles, your property types, it'll be very hard for you to make sense of this. So what I would encourage you to do is basically have a folder for houses, a houses for semis, terraces, whatever it is that your particular suburb, the housing styles in your suburb, and break it down that way, okay? Because a, a terrace or a semi has a totally different value to a freestanding house. So if you want extra folders, we have these in the Renovating for Profit office. Um, we, we charge them at a cost of $20 and we can ship them to you if you want extra. If you don't want them, just go to Officeworks and buy a three ring folder and set them up yourself, okay? So what it is, you've got dividers uh, within the, um, each section of the due diligence system. And what you've got is you've got divided for two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom, five bedroom sales. You've also got a, a tab there for other sales. So other sales might be one bedders. Um, I didn't include a one bedroom sale because there's hardly any one bedrooms for sale in most suburbs. Um, so they can go under other sales. Other sales can also be some quirky things like maybe sometimes you'll get a church that comes up for sale or a commercial office suite, whatever, to some quirky sale. And then article of interest is for what? What goes in there? your media clippings, all the positive news stories about your suburb. What you do is you basically file the properties under the, according to the number of bedrooms that they have. So what you're going to do is you're going to come home on a Saturday afternoon. You might have 20 agents brochures or you might have a couple of these. And what I need you to do is I need you to basically start ripping. If they are in magazines like this, I need you to start ripping out each of the pages like that. Okay, so this only takes about 10 minutes literally after you get home. So I'd encourage you to do it every Saturday afternoon. Like, Don't just come home and shove this in the corner of your bedroom because that's not going to give you the ability to, to make a quick decision when a property rolls around. So you're just going to come through. You're basically going to just rip them out like that. And what I do is I have, I have plastic sleeves. So I know this is probably being a little bit anal um, with the way I'm going to teach you, but it's, trust me, I've pulled this apart and redone it many times over the years and this is um, it's actually a point where it's the best way to use it. So what I do is I put plastic sleeves, a quantity of plastic sleeves under each divider. So when you get your due diligence, I'd encourage you to put 50, you know, 50 or so sleeves under each of the sections. And what you're going to start to do is you're going to start to come with these agents brochures and you're going to file. This one's a two bedroom property. So I'm going to start to file that in the two bedrooms. So I'm going to put all the two bedders together. I'm going to put all the three bedders together, all the four bedders and so on, all the five bedroom properties. Now what I do is I also put a blank piece of paper on the back because if you don't actually put the blank piece of paper, if you don't do that, I'll, tell you what ha I'll show you what happens. You don't know whether that's a floor plan for that property or whether it's a floor plan for that property. So I just find by putting that blank sheet, so literally, and it makes it much easier too, when I'm talking with real estate agents, when I'm showing them my due diligence system, I always just sort of hold it like that and I go, look, this one sold for this, this, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it makes it very easy for me to quickly um, basically follow it through. So, and it's just, it looks a lot neater. It's just a lot more manageable with that blank sheet of paper. So you're keeping everything. Sometimes you'll collect DA, like some properties will be sell it being sold, DA approval, or they might have a features, features and benefit sheet. So everything goes in that pocket and it's all kept within that sleeve. Now, what you also do is you basically, there's a little template that I've created here. I'll just grab that. So I'll just, sorry, I'll just divert a second. So that actually started making its way around. If I, sorry, Tim, if I can get you to just keep passing that around. Did anybody not see that? Okay, so we'll keep, well, most of you. Okay, so we'll keep that going around. So what I've got is I've got a little template. My little template on. 
So what I do is I have on your disc, you have this template and it's basically four to a page. So you just, when you print it out, you just get a scissor and you cut them up into little quarters. And what I do is I basically staple that to the corner. I always put it on the inside. If you have this on the outside, when you keep flicking and referencing, it'll actually fall off over time. So I just find by stapling the inside, it keeps it nice and neat. And on this little template, what it's recording is the date the property is listed, the date that the asking price, sorry, the asking price, so if the agent's quoting 750, you quote, you put 750. And and then did the property sell, tick box, yes or no? How much did the property sell for? Sold for 763. What date did it sell? What was the price variance? So if, if somebody was asking 750 and it sold for 700, you know, it sold under 3% 3, 3 under, under what the agents was quoting. So you can actually start to see which agents underquote and which agents overquote on a consistent basis. You can start to glean some of that little information. So you can go to auction knowing, hey, you know, um, Mark actually over, always overquotes about 10, underquotes about 10%. So I know to add 10% to the price that it's probably going to go for. Um, sale comments. So this is where you'll write some comments. Young couple, um, sorry, lots of demand for this property. Really nice property, well done. Poorly renovated, not so great. Looks better in the photos. Whatever it may be, any quirky comments that you noticed about that property, you would put them there. And the type of buyer, young couple, two kids. So you'll glean that. You'll be able to record this from the um, open for inspect, the auction that you attend, okay? So what you do is you then get that. So you fill that out. Now, obviously, you're going to staple the blank one. When the property sells, you're going to fill out all that detail. And what I need you to do is basically, in your due diligence system, under each section, you're basically going to file these properties from lowest to high price, okay? So obviously, if you've got the first, you know, the cheap, out of the two bedrooms, the 500,000 is the cheapest. That will be the very first one. The next one will be 505, you know, 515, whatever, and they'll work their way up. What this due diligence system does is basically what it's giving you. It's giving you the price ranges of properties basically in your suburb by, by the number of bedrooms. Now, the only other variable there is typically the land size. So um, that will be the other factor, but you want to do this primarily by the number of bedrooms, okay? So what this gives me the ability to do is that when and when and so it's a very, would you agree that's a very simple system? Yeah. Okay, but it's a really good system in that um, when it comes time for me to justifying prices to agents, Instead of me just plucking a figure out of the air, let's say a property, an unrenovated property comes on the market for 600000 and I know it's an unrenovated property, it's got good potential in terms of the scope of work. I'll go back to Chris, the real estate agent, and I'll say, Chris, you want $600,000 for this property? I'm interested, but I feel that it's about $60,000 overpriced. From where I'm sitting, it's probably only worth 500 low fives. The reason being, Chris, is that number seven, Evans Street, sold back on the 10th of, 23rd of June last year. It was um, exactly the same property. This one actually had off-street parking. This property that, you don't, that you're selling me doesn't have off-street parking. Also, this one was actually in a better condition renovated than then it's your property here, okay? So I'm interested, Chris, but why would I pay a price, pe pre a price premium for this property when that one sold that's similar? It was actually, I consider, superior to this one that you're asking here. Also, Chris, um, <laughs> what did I say? Oh, um, Chris, also 39 Bradford Street sold. 39, Br I have no idea what that was, but anyway. <laughs> What's that? Oh, <laughs> dealing with me. Uh, my worst nightmare. Probably shivers, probably shakes in terror. No, I'm joking. Uh, he loves me. Um, you can tell when agents like you because they start having funny conversations with you. Chris always tells me how he's going to the titty bar on Saturday night. So, you know, like he likes me. Um, all right. So, I like that's too much information, Chris. Um, but anyway. 39, Chris, 39 Bradford Street, that sold only two months ago. Again, that had actually had four bedrooms, Chris. The condition wasn't as good, but that actually had four bedrooms and that had off-street parking. So, Chris, why would I pay a price premium? I'm interested in buying it, but why should I be paying more when the facts are here that these properties have sold for this? This is how you're never going to be able, but if you use this system, it's a bit tedious in terms of um, you know setting this up. It doesn't actually take long on a Saturday afternoon, literally 10 minutes. So what I used to do is I used to come home from the open for inspections. Last thing I'd want to do is go out on a Saturday night. So I'd be on the, t on the lounge watching TV or just doing whatever. And I just, you know, it takes 10 minutes to quickly just rip those brochures up, stick the tags in, the sleeves are already in and away you go. And all you've got to do is just monitor what price the actual property sells for and the type of buyer and away you go.
So what, um, what it does, it gives you the ability to make very quick decisions based on you know, what prices you should be paying for a property. Also, it's going to give you the ability to go through, you know that, that how I did that three bedders, in, two bedders in Balmain, a six to nine hundred, three bedders, a nine to four. Where I get that from is this due diligence system. Because I'm filing it from lowest to higher price, I can see what the price variants are. So when a property comes on the market, I know that it's going to sell. Like, like let's say, for example, a three bedroom unrenovated house comes on the market and I look at it and I know it's a structural renovation opportunity. All I've got to do is I've got to go through my due diligence system. So I know I'm going to convert that to a four bedroom property. I'm going to go to my four bedroom section and I know, I know what's going to be, it's what it's going to be like in terms of size. And all I'm looking is for comparable sales in my due diligence system. That's what's sold. That's what this property I think is going to be similar to. And the reality is, is if, if all the properties in this system are lower than what I need it to resell for, it's not a deal. Okay, that's the reality. So as I said, this due diligence system will mean absolutely nothing when you've got five properties in it, but it will become very, very powerful when you start to, got, you start to get 50, 60 properties. So I look at my due diligence systems of my students right across the country that I catch up with when I'm travelling interstate. And they all love this system. They all say it's such a simple system, but it's so powerful. And it's a system that you can just never have the walls pulled over your eyes again. I became so good at my property pricing that I actually had the valuers um, phoning me rather than the real estate agent. So don't be scared to show your agencies. What I would encourage you is that when you, you know those agent briefings meetings that I told you to do at the three month mark, when you're ready to go and, and basically when you're starting to get in a position where you're ready to buy, take your company portfolio, take your agent's brief, and also take this due diligence system and go into them and say, look, Chris, I've been monitoring the market. I'll just quickly show you my due diligence system. So if you go through and say, look, this is how I've been recording them. So even just like this, the way these, these folders are set out, they look professional. Um, so I've, you know, I've spent really good money on, it, on these sorts of things, guys, to make you look professional. But, um, you know, go through and show them all the, all, the, all the things. They can see what you've actually been doing over the last three months so they know you're not some wafty. They can see that you've got your templates, you're monitoring prices. And so what it does, it just, it, as I said, it takes you out of that weekend warrior league and it's now starting to put you into the professional renovator mode along with your, temp your other templates like your um, high-level calculations and stuff like that. So they're going to take you a lot more seriously and they're going to start bringing the deals because that's your objective, particularly if you're going to concentrate on the inner city locations, you want them to bring those deals to you. Now, um, a quick way, if you want to build your due diligence system very quickly instead of actually waiting three months, what you can do is if, if you subscribe to RP Data, what you can do is you can actually pull up all the sales from the last 12 months. I'll quickly take you through that and just show you, and hopefully this time it, uh, it actually works. Um, ownership. So what you can do is here, you can go in, let's uh, again do it for Balmain, okay. go in and do a suburb report. So again, we're going to go in, we're going to do a search. So you might want to go back. So go back 12 or 16 months. I actually, I'd say do it um, for the year. So try and not, um, I typically set up my due diligence system on the 1st of January and I ended on the 31st of December. So I do it for a one year period. So this would be my 2011 file. So you might even want to put a sticker down there saying 2011. And then when you start a new year, you start new due diligence system. So if you want new folders, as I said, phone our office before the end of the year and we can send those new, new folders out to you however many you want um, so what you do is you come into RP data we want single residential re uh, residential so I think I pulled up 126 last time so it's just at the moment it's populating a report of what properties 189 properties have sold in Balmain in the last year so what it's saying, do you want to print a report? Yes. Now, it doesn't actually print a report unless this is, um, it just says, you know, generate the report. So what it's pulling up is all the properties that have actually sold within the last 12, um, sorry, from the last, from whatever date I set, it pulls up the properties. So number three, Adolphus Street. So what you do is you print this report out. So, you know, file print, send it to print, it'll print out all those 189 properties. And then what you do is you go back into Google. So actually, what was that first address? Was it three Adolphus Street? It's a nice street. Three Adolphus Street. Let's see if Three Adolphus Street comes up. So you can actually go back and Google, and some, a lot of the times they have the old agents brochures still on the um, internet. 
Here we go, see? Three Adolphus Street for sale, three Adolphus Street, Balmain. Property has been removed, so it's no longer on that website. So let's see if we can go back and... Um, so there you go. So what we do is we go file, print. You record what price it sold for, 1,105. So you can go back and fill out your template, 105, and that's a very quick way. So if you go back in the last year, that is a very quick way for you to build your due diligence system very, very quick. I still want you to go, I still want you to allocate at least 12 weeks still, but it's good to go back with all that history and see what has sold. So you, unfortunately, you do need, um, well, sorry, sorry, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but um, you do need RP data to be able to glean that information, okay? All right. There's a bit of reading. All right. So definitely, um, big point there is definitely don't cross collateralize your property types, okay? Because you'll get um, skewed. Now, just some some of my students, um, just to give you an example for the Brisbane people in the room, uh, and uh, and all for you as well. But some sometimes there's what's called price pockets within your suburb. You'll get a good side and a bad side. Quite often you'll have a main road. There's a good side, a bad side. Um, for the Brisbane people, for example, like High, you know, Highgate Hill. Highgate Heights, I think it is, Highgate. Um, all the properties that are high on the hill all have higher property values. All the properties in the valley are all lower property prices. So if you can see very distinct price pockets in your suburb, you might even want to split your due diligence system down again, okay? So for my, one of my Brisbane students, she's got, um, you know, obviously two, two um, Highgate um, properties, uh, two Highgate due diligence systems, one for good pocket, one for bad pocket, one on the high side, one on the low side. Because if you combine both of those, what you'll find is that it will skew the pricing and you won't be able to, you won't be able to make um, sense of it by that. So if you can identify that, that is really good. All right, auctions. So attend as, as many auctions as you can to determine who the buyers are actually buying the property. What the auctions do by attending the auctions, um, it identifies where the demand is lying. So if properties aren't selling at auction, there's clearly something wrong with that type of property or it's a property in low demand. Um, it gives you a first-hand glimpse of who the buyers are. It actually sees what properties, um, what style of properties achieve better results. So I know that typically contemporary houses um, sell better. Guys, do you mind if I take my shoes off? Okay, all right. <laughs> oh, are there any massage people in the audience? No. Um, okay, so what it does, it gives you a first-hand glimpse of the buyers. It actually tells you what properties are achieving, what styles of property actually pull higher prices. So I know that in my suburb, contemporary houses, not ultra-modern, but contemporary houses pull the best prices over federation-style houses. It actually um, shows you how emotional owner-occupiers bid. I'm going to teach you some strategies about how to control an auction situation uh, tomorrow afternoon. So uh, lots of psychology behind auctions as well. So it gives you all those sorts of things. And it actually gives you an insight into how agents work the crowd as well. So I'm going to talk to you in depth about that tomorrow. Um, and also tells you which, a which auctioneer auctioneers are good and which auctioneers are bad in your suburb. Like any occupation, you get good auctioneers, bad auctioneers. Your job is to know which one and hope to pray that you get one of the bad ones on the property that you're looking to buy. Cherie, in the area where I live, I've been going around looking at the houses and all the auctions, nothing is selling at auction. Mm -hmm. Nothing at all. And that's at going from, you know, 500,000 up, you know, 1.2 is 1.4 yep. million. Nothing at all. Um, that's probably because the media has probably got the fear of people. So, you know, there's, uh, media is so big in terms of influencing people um, in the property market. It's incredible. So um, there could be an opportunity for you there to go and buy. Yep. If it's not selling at auction, it'll still go on the market post-auction for sale. So you still see buyers going through. just means the property's not actually selling at that Sorry. point in time. Yep. Okay. So you've got to know where the negative and positive price pockets now. Um, you'll start to uncover this in your property due diligence system. You're going to start to identify where the negative and positive price pockets are. And what I mean by that, there will be streets in your suburb that have lower property values and you're going to have the good streets that have higher property values. So if you can clearly see, and sometimes it's one, side, one half of the sub, um, suburb and the other half, you've got a good and a bad side. So you're going to start to unravel this as you start to undergo this property due diligence system. You're going to start to unravel that, that you wouldn't 
wouldn't necessarily see as um, normal uh, the weekend warrior buyers. Okay, you need to know what your average block size in your suburb. In my suburb, the average block size is 200 square metres. Um, it's okay to buy anything above that, but anything that's 100 square metres, I'm seriously probably not going to consider buying, okay, because I know it'll be a major buyer objection. So you need to understand what the average block size is and look at that factor. Okay, property factors. Okay, so once you determine that A, your high level feasibility stacks up, okay, what you're going to do is you're going to phone Chris the agent and you're going to arrange an inspection in private. And this is actually where you do your property inspection checklist. Now, if you don't go through and arrange a private inspection, what's going to happen is that you will have no way to build your financial feasibility because you won't know what the scope of work is. Did you all get my video last, uh, I think it was last week or the week before, about how to do your property inspection? It's the one where I looked really haggard. Um, Okay, so did you get that last week or the week before? How to do, and it was actually with Marianne. I was training Marianne. Did you get, anybody not get that video? All right, okay, so um, we will get that sorted. Um, can I just ask at some stage, um, the people that didn't get that video, are you guys checking your spam? Your spam, your junk mail folders, because they all get sent out to you. You're all in the same group, so everybody should get those. If you're not getting your weekly videos, it's probably because they're going into your junk email folder. So if you can please add us to your safe list, that would be great. And in the meantime, if I can ask you to see Mary Ann and, um, at, before the end of tonight's out, can you just give your name to Mary Ann so we can double check to, to check the reasons why you're not getting those emails? Okay. So what you want to do is there's a property inspection checklist. So you phone Chris back, say, Chris, I'm interested in the property. As I said, you don't give him that inclination and they'll get to know you that that's just what you do. Um, so quite often, you know, I walk through a property and say, Chris, call you later. You know, give him a little wink, say so knows, you know, I'm interested, whatever, without actually letting other buyers see that. So what you want to do is you want to use this property inspection checklist, okay? And what you need to do is you need to go through on a room by room basis and you basically need to thoroughly check everything. Now, this... But the way this workshop, this spreadsheet works is that it starts at the entry and it's working right through. So it's done on a room by room basis and there's a little grid there so you can just plot out the measurements of what the, actually, if it's a square room, whether it's slightly obscure, whatever it may be, you just do a, a quick hand drawn sketch. These don't need to be architectural or anything like this. You know, just grab a quick marker and mark it out and then just write what the measurements are, what the length of the room is, what the width of the room is, okay? Because this is what you're going to come back and start to base your financial feasibility on. Um, obviously you go through, so how I do this is you start on the floor, so you look at everything on the floor, you then go up the wall, you uh, look at, you know, where there's, if there's a big hole in the wall, that needs to be patched, that means you've got to get a um, plaster in to patch that, um, you check the walls, you check the ceiling, and then anything else in between, lights, skirting boards, whatever. And all you're doing is you're going through this checklist, you're just, you know, get, you're recording the scope of work and this is what you're going to come back and build your financial feasibility. So you just need to capture the scope of work and then step number four is actually doing your financial feasibility. All right. All right, so going to do that first. So I'll take a question there. Hey Sheree, uh, the property inspection checklist, is it only done on a prospective property that that you're interested in buying? Absolutely. So you, like all those properties that are renovated, you don't have to do the property inspection checklist. It's only the one. Like you're going to know, walking through these properties, you're going to get an instinct, you're going to feel what property has got some potential. You can see it. And then your job is there to obviously capture it and then do your detailed financial feasibility if it passed all these other things first, okay? So you don't do your financial feasibility until step number four. Because okay. if the property's a lemon, there's no point doing the feasibility. I'm sure you would prefer to spend two hours elsewhere. So that's where we ring the real estate agent to, you, to view the property again. Yeah. So what you need to say to the real estate agent, you need to say, I need to have a, 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 I would like to do a thorough property inspection on the property in private. If you don't say in private, what they'll do is I'll piggyback Joe and Sally on your um, open for inspection. And in the meantime, you're going through with your clipboard, um, going through your property and you're measuring everything. You're giving them very strong signals that you're actually interested in the property. And in the meantime, Joe and Sally are probably going to be listening in or watching you with what you do. So this is your intellectual property knowledge. Don't share it with anybody. Okay, so make sure you always do your inspections. So tell the agent it's going to take you approximately one to two hours. They may leave you there or they may hang around. So at least give them the courtesy that it's going to take you at least one to two hours, depending on the size of the house, okay? 
All right. Um, and as I said, when the agents know that you do this as a business, they'll be more willing to allocate your time because they know you're a serious buyer. You're not going to be doing this on every property willy-nilly. Okay. Okay. These are things that you must do to research your property. We're going to move this through this fairly quickly. So where am I sitting with time, guys? To go? 40 minutes? Okay. This is where I go into fast mode. Okay. These are all the things that you need to do to research a property before you buy. First of all, do a Google search on the property. So if you've got a property, um, just go into Google and type, pull up the address. Anybody want me to look at address for them? No? Okay, so let's just pull up any random property. Yeah? Yep. And if there's anything quirky about the property, like go through and just see if there's anything that comes up on the internet. So quite often, if there's anything, any sort of history with the property, you'll actually find it on Google, okay? Any media, anything to do with the media, whatever it may be, it'll be on Google. So always do a search first. Okay. Um, do an RP data search on the property. Now, RP data is a fantastic tool as a professional. It's a tool of the trade. So when an agent phones me to go look at a property, if I'm wanting to in, um, look at a property in further detail, what I'll always do is an RP data search. So I'm going to get Ser Sergi from RP data to come up. Sergi, wherever you are, if you can make your way up, that would be great. Um, I'll take a quick question there in the meantime. I was just wondering how you do um, a property inspection based on, uh, on a property that you source through door knocking. Um, well you have to, you have to, I mean, if you're interested in buying the property, you ask the vendor, you say, look, I just need to come through the property and I need to basically take measurements to work out whether it's actually going to be feasible for me to buy this property. So you tell the vendor, straight, okay. I need to do an inspection. I need to come and measure up and work out whether the cost is going to be worth my while doing this property. So most vendors are more than high. And just say, look, it's going to take me about an hour. I'll be really, I won't um, cause you any inconvenience. I'll be very quick. I'll do it as quickly as possible. So you just say it in that regards. Okay. <clears throat> Um, what RP data is, um, is basically just, it's the system that I've been showing you and what it does, it gives you the ability to fly around and do all sorts of um, creative things with property. So I use RP data when an agent phones me, when Chris phones me, Monique, whoever it may be, um, quite often what I'll do is I won't even leave my desk, I'll basically type it in, type the detail into RP data and basically bring up the property. So hi, Sergi, how are you? That's good. So you want to take my spot here? Obviously. Can I use this? Yeah, sure. There you go. Easier. Whoops, you hold that. Swap it over. Mm -hmm. I'll have to just um, hold it. Gonna, yeah. So we haven't got much time today. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so what I'm going to get Ser Sergi to do, Sergi's from RP Data, and he's going to show you how RP Data works. As I said, it's an absolute vital tool. Um, I can't live without it. Um, so what we, what we, if we, what we can do, Sergi, is um, pull up just the individual property detail. Yep. No, uh, just a uh, quick overview for somebody who haven't heard about RP Data. Um, it's number one uh, database uh, and property and sales database provider in the country. Um, there's other uh, database uh, providers available for property and sales data, but the, the, the main reason why uh, all of you should be using RP Data, not because I work for RP Data, is because it's the only company that has all of the information on, on, on each property. You know, this, it's, we're talking about due diligence. It's not enough just to have partial information that you can find on Google or on the internet. There's all this information that RP Data collected over uh, 18 years. It's never get dele deleted. You can go back to uh, any property uh, and view history and sales records, etc. Sorry, if I can just add to yep. that. So where, um, where all the data comes from RP Data is that when a property gets sold, it actually gets registered with the land titles office in your own respective state, and then RP Data pay a license to actually access that information. Yeah, that's correct. But apart from that, RP Data spends uh, $10 million a year on collecting uh, extra data. And 70% of RP Data is actually comes from outside government sources. Uh, RP Data has a team of uh, people that call every auction in the country. They speak to the agent and they try to get them to record uh, uh, the sale price in RP Data. Um, we also collect all the advertisements from local newspapers, <coughs> national newspapers, as well as realestate.com and the main, and also keep it uh, in RP Data indefinitely. So, to give you an example, Sheree try, uh, you know, brought up the property on, on, on Home Hunt. It's taken off the internet, so you can't view it. It is on realestate.com still. But when it's taken off the internet, 
API data still has this information. That's very important. Um, so, so yeah. we'll just go, go so to... So if we can go straight yeah, into the system, yeah. It's more interesting. All right. Um, API Data uh, just launched a new uh, platform. It's API Data Professional. Um, if, you s if you get API Data through uh, Renovating for Profit, you'll have access to both sites. Shri demonstrated you the classical version. I'll show you the, the new um, beta version of the professional site, which is um, much more easy to use. So give you an example. For example, we'll, we'll type in the suburb of St. Mary's. Or is there anybody that wants us to do a real-life example for them? Anybody looking at acquiring a property on the market at the moment? <coughs> yep. Ascot Vale, and what's the address? Um, Forty-five Charles Street. Forty-five Charles Street in Ascot Vale. C H A R R L E S Street, <coughs> Ascot Vale. Is it coming up? Uh, That's in Melbourne. There we go, third one down. And this is the other advantage. With, uh, uh, we have a special uh, uh, arrangement with uh, Renovating for Profit, and you have a, a national access, so you can search uh, any state. You're not limited to a particular council uh, or area of the uh, metropolitan area. You, you have access uh, nationally. <coughs> so this is the property in question that we uh, brought up. So you can see that uh, there is a, um, a last sale price of three, uh, 335000 uh, 19th of February 2003. Um, so you have a sale price, uh, the sale date, and the settlement date. So the sale occurred on 19th of February, and the settlement occurred on 17th uh, of April 2003. So you also have uh, low DP numbers and uh, local authority, uh, which is like a local council, so you can, you can see uh, where, where it is. Um, we, you also have... Uh, the photographs, the, the photographs which are available, <laughs> all right, so you can see if the property has been advertised in the past uh, five, six years, we'll also have uh, uh, internal photographs as well. Okay. So those photographs never get deleted. So you can see if the property has been renovated, then you'll be able to see uh, obviously more photographs. Yes, please. <laughs> <coughs> um, in the classical, yes. I, this is a beta version. There will be dates uh, that very shortly. But in the classical version, yeah, it's a very, very good point. Yeah, you can see when it was done, etc. Um, you also have ownership details. Not in every state you have ownership details. So you can see the owner of this property. And um, you also have um, attributes. <coughs> so you've got um, n number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, etc. So it's two bedroom, one bathroom. Uh, to garage. Sorry, so if I just stop you there. So this is a great tool in terms of being proactive in your renovating. Um, you've got all the contact details there, so I'd be dropping a letter. Are we allowed to do that? Uh, Some states you are. It, yeah, in, um, unfortunately in Victoria you're not allowed to do that, yep. uh, but uh, in New South Wales you can. Yep. W uh, we also have a phone database that's merged into uh, sales and ownership uh, database. So in some cases you'll see the owner's details and the phone number. Um, so, you know, if it's, uh, if it's allowed in other states, you can pick up the phone or knock on the door yep. and um, especially talking about acquiring properties that are not on the market. Sure. So I've included in your templates, I think it's under step number five, um, basically those letters to acquire those properties. So you've already got the templates in your system, so you can basically print them out and off you go. You can post them. Sorry, can I just go back for a second? Yep. What I like about um, RP Data 2 is you've got the sales history. So see there you've got those columns where... Uh, down here, it gives you a history of, of when the property actually became on the market. So sometimes an agent will phone you and um, if you haven't been monitoring the market closely, say, Shri, um, this property's on the market and you may not realise it's been on the market for two months, whatever it may be, it's not so hot. So that's always a good one to look at the sales history. Um, sometimes you'll find properties that have just been dragging on and on. They're great ones to start to go in and really negotiate with, do creative offers on. Yeah, so you can see the sales history. You also, uh, if the property has been on the market, uh, you'll see the advertising history. I'll show you the sample very shortly. And uh, also rental history as well. So you can, you can get an idea of the estimated rental income. So um, can we just, um, so we're just running short of time. Yeah, so do the straight view? Go, um, go straight view and then straight yeah. to the aerial. Yeah. Yep. Right. Um, 
this new version allows you automatically link uh, the property to sites like Google and Microsoft, so you can see the street view. Uh, and um, but there's also a, a proprietary mapping system within API Data. We have our own uh, API Data photographed every single property in metro in every metropolitan area in Australia in 2005, 2006, even before Google. So we have those images for each property. So if somebody physically walked around with the camera and took those photographs. So what this is good for, see this here? If you're looking at a block, see, you can even see how it compares to what the average size in is in comparison to all the other properties on the street. So you can see if something's really um, small or extremely large in comparison to the other properties in the, in the, in the suburb. So you can, you, there's plenty of layers. You can, uh, you can undo aerial photographs. Um, and uh, you can zoom in, but the advantage of this system is that you can, uh, you can put sales history on the map. So you can put sales details, land size, zoning. You can also measure distances. You can measure a any distance on the map, it's very accurate, up to, up to tens of meter. We have surveys using this system. That's a very quick way to see what the average block size is in your suburb, just by pulling up that map alone. Um, you can see what's the block, average and block size. And you can you can measure roughly this, the house, so you can see it. You can measure the driveway, etc. Um, you can. Um, Sorry, sorry, I'm just interrupting you for a second. So, so where that for structural renovators, this is where you don't even need to leave your home office. You can basically, when Chris the agent phones you and say, you know, number 18 Clay Clayton Street has come on the market, quickly jump on RP data. I can fly over it. I can measure the house. I know that the block is 200 square metre. The house at the moment is 70 square metres. I know I can get another, that's a 70 square metre structural renovation waiting to happen. And I, can, I can determine that without even stepping a foot on the site. Yes. Um, API, data, uh, API data values every property in Australia every day now. And um, based on this, we have excellent uh, statistical data based on, this, on the street, suburb, uh, postcode, um, city. Uh, so this, it's not, we're talking about l uh, like a, a macro analysis. Micro analysis, there's, ma uh, there's other reports that you have access to as well. So what, um, what I like about RP Data is this aerial map. Um, so you can just fly around. So what you can do is, without even leaving your, um, you know, your chair, you can basically, s even maybe if you maximise it, that screen if you can, Sergi. You can actually fly around and see if there's any adverse industrial activity, whether it's too close to the retail strip, whether there's a petrol station. You can actually yeah, you fly can around and see. You can see. move the map. Yes, you can move the map. So are you able to do that? Yep. yep. It's usually faster. This is uh, this is like a, a bit slower. Um, yeah, one of those uh, mobile internets. Okay, cool. So it just gives you the ability to check, you know, whether it's a cemetery. So you can fly over and go, "What's that?" You can zoom in on it and go, "Oh, geez, it's a cemetery. There's no way I'm, you know." Don't want to die to get into that suburb, all right? So um, it just gives you the ability to weed out deals and say no to deals even before you leave your chair. But it's not just that. I, I can click on info, find property, and I can click on any property here and find out the details on that property. So I can work within the map. So th this property details comes up. I'm sorry? The shading, what does the shading mean? Shading. Shading, the colours, the yellow, the purple. Ah, the shading, uh, that's, that's just to quickly identify, uh, let me just have a look. All right. The zoning? Uh, zoning as well as, uh, this is the Sims legend, right. So you can, you can quickly identify properties uh, that are currently on the market or ha have recently been on the market, uh, properties sold within uh, last year, two years, three years, and then multiple sales within three year period. Very good system. So, Sergey. Yes. Here. This is only showing information about properties that have been sold in the last five years. No. No, no, for, no. for the last 50 years, I think, isn't it? Or since 1930 or something? Um, each state is different. For example, in, uh, in New South Wales, it's uh, from 1970. Uh, in other states, uh, but in nationally from 1991, every property will have a sales record. But 
API data has property information for 100% of the properties. That's so, my so, question, so, really. So we, we, we may not have the sale price if it's prior to 1970. If so there won't be a guesstimate as to a sale price. Say you've got a house which has uh, had somebody living in it for very many years. Yes. And it we might be a huge house. No, they, no guesstimate. These are real factual transactions. There's no makeup, no, no somebody putting the property on the market and wanting to get something and listing it. This is transactions that have been listed through the land titles office. It's factual stuff. But if it's prior to 1970? Before 1970, I can't comment. So that, what we're saying is that right. transactions before 1970 aren't captured. They're not captured. Yeah, they're not there. Ele uh, uh, Australian government started capturing electronic uh, property sales transactions in 1991. But you don't need transactions before 1970 anyway. It would be it's, it you want to be, be looking at transactions in the last 12, 24 months at the most, back to 2000. Anything before that's irrelevant. Yeah. I don't know. I might want to know something. I've got a particular example in mind. Yeah, what's the example? Well, um, say a property, yeah. which is very large, very desirable, but yep. hasn't traded in 60 years. Yep. So my question to Sergi is, would there be an indicative price yes. for that property? There yes. would be. A valuation be. price? Uh, as, I, as I mentioned to you, Data values every property every day, Australia-wide, every property. And uh, currently we have Commonwealth Bank using this system. For, uh, for their loan approvals. But so the every, every loan application will run through the database, but it will be an addictive price because obviously... So don't confuse the two. Sale date is real prices that the property transacted for and then the valuation is something entirely different, okay? So if you want to know exactly what a property sold for, always, always refer to this column here, which is the sale price right there. That is true factual transactions. Yes, but it, it's not. It's not. If there's no price, it's, it's not in a database. But we, we, we do. We, you can get a separate. Re, you can look at separate report for that. Okay, take it. Yeah. If if there is if there is an auction on Saturday, Apidara will have this record on on Saturday, in in Apidara, yeah, because they 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 ring every auction. Yeah, but 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 if it's being passed in. It it. Sold and yep. Bend or bid or if the property is advertised the next week with the price, yeah. it'll be there in the system. It'll be in the advertising history, not the sales price. Okay, right. So don't confuse the two. All right, this is yeah. the advertising history, for example. Exactly. Question there. Yep. How do you find the current valuation? It RP data's valuation? It's it's called an order val. It's 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 Wh where is it on the system? On oh, the screen? On the screen, okay. It's it's actually built in in the in the, in, the, in, the, in the system. So uh, do you want me to show you CMA quickly? Uh, how long is it going to take? Five minutes. Okay. okay. All right. Okay, this is, uh, this is CMA, Comparative Market Analysis Report, so we'll do it on this property in, in Victoria. And um, it's very easy way to compare properties because you, you compare apples and apples. So, for example, this is three bedroom, one bathroom, two car gar uh, garage house. So we select houses, three bedroom, one bathroom, two car. And you can see all, all of the recent sales are coming up. Those ones just sold, they had either auction result properties or uh, sold by private treaty, but we're still capturing that uh, through agents. So we quickly identify six recent sales in, in, the, in that um, radius of 500 meters. So you can increase that radius search to up to five kilometers. Right, so, so this is the first step. So the next step, select properties on the market. So we, we, we compare past sales with currently ask, asking prices. Okay, we have, we have four, four properties here that um, are available in, the, in that description. So we can select that. Next, market comparison. Market comparison is very important. And this is, this is why you need RP data because the, there's a lot of analytics that that happening here. Market compare analyzes how long the, the average property is on the market in a particular area uh, before it's sold, and what is the vendor discounting. The, the, with the vendor discounting, they split it into two. One is the advertised price discounting. Second one is the, 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 the difference between the last advertised price and the actual sold price. So this is important because you can look at some suburb and look at the average discounting of 10%. So you can just walk in 
any property and just say, look, I'm offering you 10% less b based on this. And you can print it out and show them this report. Um, so it's important to see uh, which, uh, you know, each area obviously would be different. All right, so th this is it. And then you can uh, preview it or generate a PDF and the report is done. And then it'll even give you an indicative uh, estimated price. But as Shuri said, it's not, it's only an indi indication. You would never sort of rely on it. Uh, you have to do your own research. Once you, once you do your own research, once you look at the recent sales, because the idea is you look at, you don't just rely on the computer to pick those re uh, uh, comparable properties. Once, once, the, once you look at the recent sales, you have to look at each particular property. You can open it up, uh, look at the photographs, look at the previous history, look how long it's been on the market. And um, because the sale result by itself doesn't tell the true picture. If the property sold for a million dollars, maybe it's a great result. But if you look that it took them two years to sell, that's not as, as a great result. Basically, they just waited for the market to, to catch up. Yep. Um, all right, so this is, uh, this is the report. Uh, it shows you uh, uh, property description, pr uh, previous transactions. So the, all of this stuff, stuff that Sergei, Sergei is pulling out right now, this is really good stuff to build into your spotters fees reports as well. So uh, largely it does a lot of that for you. I'm just generating PDF. You can generate a PDF, save it on your computer. Um, those reports are also kept in memory um, in, in, in your access. Each, each stu uh, graduate student, um, which terminology is using, <laughs> will get right. their, their own access. Um, so when you use API data, you can save things and come back to those, uh, to those properties. Um, I think Sergei's getting that. Uh, the yeah. Yes, it did. Uh, it, uh, between, uh, the, it gives you the price range, <coughs> s s uh, s uh, 740 uh, to 900. And what it is, the wider the price range, the bigger uh, st uh, forecast standard deviation. The, all right, and what you normally have to do is you have to take a midpoint. If you take the midpoint, you can't go wrong um, on, on that. So this is why RP data is a great, you can see clearly see it's a very good till, tool, but this is where you supplement this knowledge. So with that particular property that we've used there, this is where I would come back in. So that system is saying that, and this is where I'd now come in, I'd look in my three bedroom section, and I'd go, okay, where are the comparals in my, in my library? So if you use these two in sync with each other, there's absolutely no way that you can pay too much for a property. Okay, so I have to pick, um, Take a couple of quick questions and we'll move on for RP data. Yes, at the back will, there. Will RP data also reflect the improvements done to the property? Like if it, if it was subdivided, converted from a two bedroom to a four bedroom, and the sale price is associated with it, or if the land is subdivided? Yes, RP data is the only company that uses uh, uh, hedonic indices, and that's another clever word. I've that, never that, even heard that, of that. That you've heard so today. Yeah. Um, what it means that um, it relies on attributes. It would not value the property based on um, uh, not knowing how, uh, not just how many bedrooms and how many bathrooms, but also improvements. And uh, API Data collects 140 attributes, uh, well, tries to collect for each property. So you may not see it in the screen, but, but it's behind the, uh, the algorithm. So uh, it's good. the question is yes. Um, and we also uh, get it not just from real estate agents, we also uh, get information from values when they value the property, when they tick all the boxes, how many, how many uh, you know, uh, PowerPoints it has, et cetera. Okay, our last question off the back there on API data. Um, is it true that there's no coverage for Tazi? Uh, no, it's not true. As I said, we have uh, we the only company that offers truly national access. It's as many in the, uh, uh, it was the last state when uh, the government was holding back and didn't want to sell us the data, um, but we had to sort of take take some steps, and we have as many now. It's it's we've had it for more than six months now. Okay, great. What I love API data for is, um, particularly if you're going to do developments, for example, in my, um, in my suburb, you've got to have a minimum of 200 square metres for each lot. So you can um, go into this system, you can type in, um, pull up all the properties in my suburb that are more than 400 square metres and start to identify which properties are on the hit list. You go back, you type those addresses in, you fly over them, you can see which ones have already been subdivided, which ones don't, and you go in and target the ones that basically have the opportunity there. So can you see how it's about being a proactive person, not a reactive person? So Sorry, the more Shuri, you can do this, Just better. for two seconds, I I'll quickly want to show the analytics behind it. So you can, you can see that this is the graph in that particular uh, suburb over the uh, past three years. Very good to see something like that because it shows sometimes seasonal uh, variations. 
Sometimes it's better to buy a property in winter, not, not in spring when everybody else is in the market. And, uh, and then you, uh, some of those variations can be explained by the interest rates uh, and mm -hmm. uh, other factors. So you can, you can, you can do this research uh, from the comfort of your own home. Uh, just mentioning that, Apidata is also now on iPhone. There's a special app. It's, uh, it's only available to subscribers and also iPad as well. It, it uses augmented reality. I'm not, not a clever word. Um, so you can actually stay in front, of the, in front of the property, point your iPhone at the property, and, and on the screen you see all these past sales, previous sales. Oh, really? Sales. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. that's impressive. I um, didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, this, this, this app has been released. Well, uh, I can't wait to test that. Just for uh, less than two months. It's already won three awards uh, in Australia wow. and uh, just uh, two days ago, three in, uh, international awards Excellent. as well. Excellent, that's yeah. unreal. Um, right, cool. Yeah, so any more questions? All right, so you probably have a question on how much it costs, right? Um, now, the reality is um, with RP Data, it is um, RP Data do have to pay licence fees to the government, so it's not the cheapest. It's, it's a very obviously a very good system. It's not the cheapest system around. You get what you pay for. Um, so we have a corporate rate. Now, normally if you are to subscribe to this as a, a, a weekend warrior, um, I, think the, I think it's about is it 8000 a year or something like that. Um, do you know what the rough figures are? You're probably closer to the pricing than a what year. I am. Um, what is, as a retail consumer? If you were to get national access. Yeah. Um, because, because Victorian access, uh, Victorian government, you have to pay royalty on, to on top of access. Uh, so it's quite expensive. It's seven, $700 a week in royalty only for, for, for Victoria. Yes, it's, it's, it's um, but even if you take out Victoria, you're probably looking at uh, even more than 8000 so it's more as a retail consumer, like a weekend warrior, you know what I mean by that? Um, so you're paying, it's quite expensive. So we've done a, um, a deal with um, RP Data, because obviously for all my graduates around the country, um, it was recently $208 a month, and then we've just been able to, through the volume discounts that our students are all going through now, we've been able to get that price down to 180 a month for RP Data. So if you certainly want to subscribe to RP Data, we can get you up and running. So you're looking at about, uh, what it is, $2,000 a year to have that access, but it's a pretty fundamental tool for you as um, professional developers. Um, so if you do want to subscribe to RP Data, the forms are certainly the application form is in your manuals there, so fill that out and just pass it to the crew members. If I can ask, you can pass that to say Mary Ann, I can kind of delegate you as the RP Data subscription girl. And, um, uh, and, and we can actually get you started um, Monday, Tuesday of next week or whenever you, whenever you want to and tell don't, us. And don't be afraid to print it out and take it to real estate agents because 90% um, of real estate agents in Australia use RP Data. So if you bring them information from Apidara, as Shiri was saying, that they'll, they'll, they'll treat you differently. They'll treat you on a professional level. They'll go back to the vendor and they'll say, look, I, ca I, I can't sell them uh, a dream, right? Because they, they've, they've got Apidara information. Absolutely. And, um, you know, let's just negotiate uh, the price. Yep. So you actually will be helping uh, the agent to negotiate uh, on your behalf. So when you, um, uh, when you, I've actually forgotten what I was going to say. All right, that's fine. Okay, done. Thank you, Sergi. Thank you for giving up your Saturday night. I appreciate okay. it. Thank you, guys. Sergi. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right. So where are we sitting with time, uh, Lise? All right. Okay. <laughs> now, I presume you all want to get out of here, right? Okay. Okay. All right. So, we're only um, halfway through step number three. So, we, I was on time uh, two hours ago. Now, I'm not. Um, so, what we'll have to do is I'll continue to a couple more points for the next five minutes. And if you don't want to stay back an extra half an hour or so, I can continue on with this tomorrow morning. Is that your preference? Yeah? Okay, cool. No dramas. All right. Um, so in terms of... So RP Data is a great tool to search for the property initially. Yes? 
And um, also what you want to do, oh, your due diligence, that's what I'm forgetting, I'm getting signals. Sorry, all the people that haven't received their due diligence systems, I think there's about 60 of you in the audience, so please, if you've already got them, don't put your hand up because it means somebody else will miss out. So if I can quickly just hand those out while we're waiting. Sorry? So it's everybody with the blue dot on the back of your card. If you've got a blue dot, there's no blue dots. Green dot. All right, so what I want you to do is when you've done the initial IP data search, what I encourage you to also do is go into your local council and conduct a property search. Now, this is really easy to do. Any property that you're looking at is you just go to the customer service council counter. You tell the people, look, I'm looking at buying uh, such and such property at such and such address. Can you please jump on the computer and, and just um, do a property search for me and tell me um, the history of the property? So councils can literally type in the address of the property and they will tell you if there's been any past development applications lodged, where there's been any any issues, where the property is in a floodplain zone, um, if it's got contaminated material, they've got a lot of information on the council website so that they can tell you um, basically a lot of stuff about the property. So definitely do that. So they've got the history, they've got the planning changes, past building applications, they've got the zoning of the property. Um, you can actually also read through council's files. If there's been a past development application lodged in the file, you can pay an archive fee. In my council, it's about $50 and they will actually, somebody will go physically into the council archive files. They will actually drag the file out. Um, so you have to wait about a week and you can actually read through everything that do with that history of that property in its entirety. So it's really good reading. I've done that many, many times for some properties that I've looked at buying in the past. Also conduct a historical price search on the property as well. Um, sorry, a historical police search. Um, the reality is, is that some properties get sold for not so nice reasons. I'll give you one example, the Gonzales house in Sydney. Um, anybody not aware of that house? Okay, you all know the house where a family of five people got slain to death. Okay, so an unsuspecting buyer didn't do his property due diligence on that. This was about two years ago. It was in the, hit the media. Um, a family, a, an Asian family came in and bought the house. And then obviously the neighbours told them um, they'd signed the contract, they'd paid the deposit. The neighbours or whoever told them that the property, um, five people were mur murdered in that house. And basically they like freaked out as any normal person would. And um, they tried to get their deposit back. They couldn't get their deposit back. So um, basically they signed a legally binding contract. So I think Neil Jenman got involved um, and I think somebody from LJ Hooker or somebody got involved and they actually got their deposit back. They were very lucky. But that could have, you know, obviously a lot of legal issues there, a lot, of, probably a lot of expense incurred to that person who uh, was looking at coming and buying that property, trying to get out of that situation and a very quick Google search, um, typing up that address in the property in the internet would have brought, you know, hundreds of media articles up about that particular thing. Also, you can also go into the police station. Um, you may not always get this information, but a great way to source information about properties and also your suburb is to go into your local police station and say, look, I'm looking at buying this property in such and such a street. Can you tell me if there's any, been, like, have you got anything in your system about that property? And can you also tell me, is this a relatively good, good side of the suburb, good street, bad street? Because those police officers, they're on their beat. They know where the bad streets are in your suburb, where the crime, what streets not to buy in. So they can be really good sources of information as well. My sister was a police officer and she said to me that she's had people come in um, in the past. I've never done this physically myself, but my sister's told me that people have come in and asked that sort of... So um, if your police officer is having a good day, you'll get the information. If they're not, you won't. 
that simple. <laughs> All right. Um, when you're in council, just also check with them that there's not going to be any development application. So when you go into council, say to them, I'm looking at buying su this such and such property on number whatever, you know, 123 ABC Street. Um, can you tell me, are there any development applications in progress or undergoing or being advertised at the moment that may negatively impact this property? When a, an adverse development is going in, a lot of the times the surrounding neighbours will freak out. They'll put their property on the market because they know it's going to be built in a year. So unsuspecting buyers can come in, think they've got the deal of a century only to discover that in six months' time there's going to be a big industrial factory next to their little residential semi. So always make sure you do that search when you go straight into council. All right, we're going to stop there today and what we're going to do tomorrow morning is we're going to come back. We've got about 40 things that you must research on an individual property level when you're basically undertaking your due diligence. Okay.